Yeah. Okay, well, can we on to the first BPS of this semester? And we're running the same format that we had last semester. There will be two 45 minute talks. The first one is more of a general audience talk and the second one is gonna be a research seminar. And today we're very happy to have Shantan Chakravarti from TFR Mumbai. And he's gonna talk about his work, his work on improved bounds for perfect sampling of K colorings in, in graphs, please. Uh, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so thanks for having me and thanks for coming. So this is work that we did some time ago, maybe one and a half years has been, it's been quite some time, but uh, this work appeared in stock uh, 2020, I think. Yeah, 2020. And this was work that I did with my colleague and very dear friend, Siddharth uh, Bhandari, who is uh, just went to Simon's, I think. So let me just, without delay, start. So what is a problem statement? So suppose that you are given a graph and the size of the graph is n. That is the graph has n vertices. Okay. And you're also given uh, a promise that the maximum degree of the graph is this capital delta. And you're also given a set of colors k. So this by this notation, I, I mean one comma two up to k. Okay. And what we have to do is produce a uniformly random sample from the set of all proper colorings on this graph. Okay. Uh, so we will denote by this capital pi the uniform distribution on the set of all proper colorings. And when I mean a proper coloring, I mean a coloring uh, fun a function which uh, assigns a color to each vertex a of the graph and such that if two vertices share an edge, uh, the colors assigned to the uh, to the vertices of that edge are uh, not the same. Is there a question? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 the issue is that we have to do this efficiently, as in we have to design an algorithm which outputs a uniformly random sample in expected polytime and polytime in the size of the graph that is in this, in this integer n. Okay. Now, this, why is this problem hard? So in general, even uh, for any, uh, any k, for any arbitrary k, even fired, uh, even the decision problem, to find out whether this set script C of proper colorings is empty or non-empty, even that problem is empty hard. Uh, for example, three colorability. You give me a, a, any any graph, a, an arbitrary graph on n vertices, and you ask, and you give me three colors, and you ask me, is this graph three colorable? This is n, this is empty hard. So the kind of bounds that we will be aiming for. So our whole deal is trying to minimize the number of colors that that we need to use. Okay. And the kind of, kind of bounds that we'll be aiming for is k greater than c delta, where c is greater than 1. Okay. So why such a thing? Because see, if you take the best possible case, that k is greater than equal to delta plus 1, then a greedy strategy, uh, using a greedy strategy, you'll be uh, at least able to tell that this set script c is non-empty. At least that much you'll be able to tell. Okay. Another thing to notice is that uh, accept reject will not work. And the reason for that is the set script c in comparison to the set of all colorings, proper improper, okay, all colorings, the, 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 the size of this set is very small. And by very small, I mean exponentially small. And you can sort of uh, see this if you look at a, 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 a binary tree of size n, n is some power of two maybe, okay. So this ratio is inverse exponential in n. And hence, uh, uh, if, if, if you do an accept reject kind of sampling algorithm, that algorithm will take expected time exponential in, in uh, to, to terminate. That is not good. So uh, again, our goal is to minimize this C so that uh, an efficient uh, al algorithm exists, which produces a perfect a, a, a sample from the, uh, from the uniform distribution on script C. Okay, uh, the, and the previous uh, best bond before, before our work uh, was, quite some time time or time ago in 98 it was given by huber and huber showed that such an algorithm does exist when k is greater than delta square plus 2 delta and remember that del this capital delta is the degree of the graph okay i should also mention uh, some something that after this paper came out uh, i think james james Sai and sahani they ha had an amazing paper which improved upon ours and they essentially brought down this uh, constant so uh, our contribution is we did away with the with the quadratic dependence on delta. Okay, we brought it down to three delta. And uh, what Jane Sahani did using uh, 
the algorithmic form of the Lovash lo local lemma, which we know as the Moser fi fixed algorithm. So using Mo Moser's fi fixed algorithm, they essentially brought this three down to, I think, eight, eight by three, something like 2.66, something like that. Okay. And that is an amazing paper. So that, that is right now the state of the art. Uh, and, but you might ask me, why do we care for these constants? My only answer is that uh, the Markov chains community cares a lot for constants. So a uh, lot of fight has been going on over bringing a two down to, uh, let's say something much smaller than two in the approximate sampling domain. And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of get to that later. So before everything, let me uh, sort of tell you uh, what is the bedrock of all our arguments. So uh, uh, the bedrock is a, is a sampling algorithm, is a sampling technique called Glauber dynamics. Okay. This is name taken from physics because all of, a lot of this Markov chains literature is inspired from physics literature. So, so what, does, what does this process do? So the Glauber dynamics is a random process which does the following. So suppose I am given this graph, okay? This is some, uh, some instance of a graph and I'm given a coloring tie on this graph, okay? So again, by coloring, I mean an assignment of colors to the vertices of the graph. So what the global dynamics will do is st at step one, it will choose a vertex of the graph uniformly at random. So in this case, let's say uh, the vertex chosen is this vertex. Then uh, the algorithm looks at the colors that are uh, occupying, uh, uh, that are occupying the neighbors of. Them. So in this case, that set of colors is blue and red. Okay. Uh, blue, uh, blue and red. And, and, and suppose that this uh, bigger uh, oval or ellipse is the set of all, all, all the colors that are available to me. Okay. So now what will the algorithm do? It'll, it'll look at this block set. So we'll call uh, this set red and uh, blue, uh, the block set and look, and it will uh, sample a color uniformly at random from everything that is outside. That is from the set K minus the block colors. So formally, uh, the algorithm chooses a color C, U A R, from K minus chi N V. And when I say chi N V, I mean the co colors that are occupying the neighbors. Okay. And it just updates V to that color. So for, for this example, suppose that uh, uh, the color that was chosen by the algorithm is yellow. So uh, it, 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 it'll just update this uh, green vertex, the, the, the vertex V to a yellow. So uh, it is not very hard to see that this Markov chain. So, so this is a Markov chain, okay? And the state space of this Markov chain is the set of all proper colorings on, on, on this graph, okay? And it's not very hard to see that the detail balance equations are satisfied. That is the probability of transition from one coloring, say from chi to chi prime, is the same as the transition probability from chi prime to chi. And that is very easy to see why, because what is the transition probability? So you choose this vertex field that is with the probability one over N, and then you choose a color outside that is with probability one third. And the exact same process can happen if you take a reverse. So this is a reversible ergodic Markov chain. And uh, also the detail balance equations are satisfied. That is mass flowing forward is also is the same as probability mass flowing backward. So that means that the stationary distribution of this Markov chain is actually uniform over the over the set of all colorings. And this, uh, this is key. This is key to the following thing. So suppose I have this weaker demand that, uh, okay, maybe I can't sample exactly from uh, the uniform distribution on the set of all colorings, but maybe I can sort of, you know, create, create a distribution, which is very close in total variation distance. Let's say some epsilon close in total variation to, to this perfect distribution that I have. And epsilon is obviously small. So can we do that? And, and the answer is yes. So using, using global dynamics, this is possible. So this is a very big, uh, uh, big theorem in uh, Markov chains theory, which one studies in a, in a, uh, at the very beginning of a course is that, you know, if you run this uh, uh, global dynamics algorithm many times, so you, you, you start off from, uh, you start off from a single arbitrary coloring, let's say, chi, okay. And then you keep on running many iterations of the glob, of, of the global dynamics uh, over and over again, let's say for some time T then for large enough T, it is guaranteed that this will indeed happen that the distribution that is induced by, uh, this T many applications of the global dynamics is indeed close to, uh, the stationary distribution of the Markov chain. But here's the issue. The time taken is proportional to log one over epsilon. Okay. 
So this is called this is called the fast mixing property, quote unquote fast mixing property of the Gower dynamics. Um, the issue is the following: this is fine for approximate sampling. But if you want to do perfect sampling, that is, if you want this total variation to be zero, then you're in trouble. Because as you can see, the time taken to uh, do the sampling blows up. It, uh, the, 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 the algorithm becomes infeasible, okay? So before moving on, let's uh, look at uh, some, some, some literature. So in approximate sampling, approximate sampling has been explored uh, extremely heavily. I think there's a question. Oh, oh, no question. Uh, no, no, it's not a question. Sorry, I just posted again for people who joined late. Oh, oh, oh okay. Okay, okay sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, so approximate uh, approximate sampling has seen a lot of work. Okay, and it started with uh, a breakthrough paper by Jerome in '95, where he showed that if k is greater than two delta, you can do approximate sampling of of colorings from from the uh, uniform distribution on, on all proper colorings. Okay, but Jerome's proof is very uh, how should I put this? Uh, very cumbersome. Okay, so he essentially uh, he, he does this by a coupling argument, and he shows that you know if you run two Markov chains to cup uh, two Markov chains using the same randomness cleverly using the same randomness if using the same points. If you run two different Markov chains from two different states, then uh, on expectation, uh, if k is greater than two delta, that the the distance uh, between uh, the Hamming distance between uh, these two Markov chains, the states of these two Markov chains are at every point of time on expectation reduces. Okay, uh, but a breakthrough was uh, came uh, in ninety seven, two years later, by Bubli and Dyer, who uh, simplified this analysis like crazy. So what what these guys did was something called the path coupling method. So they showed that okay, you don't have to consider all possible pairs of uh, of starting states. You can repeat. Uh, Jerome's coupling argument, but only with starting states that differ maybe only at one side. Okay, and then essentially what they did was they extended this whole thing to a metric on the uh, space of all, uh, on 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 the entire state space and showed that okay, if your uh, if your coupling uh, contracts on expectation for uh, these uh, uh, pair of states which are apart only in Hamming distance one. Then you can show the same same sort of contraction for any two pair of states. So that was the extension, and this is and this technique is called path coupling. And uh, this paper is uh, and I mean, the biggest breakthrough in this area was came in two thousand, where Eric Vigoda showed by writing down an LP that you can actually and by a completely different dynamics, not Glauber dynamics. He we he called it he he called it flip dynamics. So using flip dynamics, he showed that even uh, k greater than 11 by 6 delta, you can get an approximate sampler. And Vigoda's paper is insane. I mean, we try, we have tried to read it at least five times. We have failed every time because at some point you just don't realize where the intuition came from. It's that uh, it's it's like a magic. It, it's like magic. I mean, I, I don't have anything else to say about it. And these guys tried to sort of simplify Vigoda's work. So Chen, Delcord, Moitro, Perano, and Fossil, they in 19. They tried to demystify it. They showed that okay, you write down an LP and you sort of uh, show that the optimum of the LP is close to this 11 by 6, and you can go maybe a little bit below 11 by 6, but not by too much. On the other hand, perfect sampling, uh, nothing, there was no progress ever since Huber's work. So maybe uh, 90, so Huber, as I says, said earlier, showed that there's an uh, there's an effi efficient perfect sampler for k greater than delta square plus two delta. Uh, in 90, Feng Guo and Yin, for, from a completely different different perspective called strong spatial mixing, they showed that for k greater than delta square minus delta plus two and uh, some other conditions, you get a perfect sampler. But this is still very unsatisfactory because of the delta square nature, and they need to use some concentration properties. That is why this delta actually needs to be log log n sort of a thing. An amazing paper. Uh, when when we were actually doing this work was by Liu Sinclair and uh, Piyush, uh, Piyush at the IFR. They came up with an approximate counter, a deterministic approximate counter, not a randomized approximate counter, deterministic approximate counter for the number of uh, proper colorings of a graph. And they showed that such a thing exists when K is greater than two delta. And there is this very old paper, 1977 by uh, JVV, Jerome, 
valiant vigoda jira vigoda valiant or, or something like that so those three people they showed that if you have a deterministic approximate counter that implies the existence of a perfect sample so this paper is really really amazing the only catch is that the running time has delta sitting as a power of n okay so if delta is even log n this is not going to work out so delta needs to be order 1 it needs to be constant this is where this is the this was a gap in the literature and uh, this is precisely what our work addressed that for k greater than 3 delta it doesn't matter you don't have any conditions on delta you don't have any conditions on k k greater than 3 delta you have a perfect sample and and we of course all, all, also um, look the yeah one question, question shankar yeah, yeah. so sorry of, what's the difference between jerems this thing and bubbly and dia yeah so okay. jerems this thing uh, jerems sh showed it showed uh, this thing using a coupling argument so this coupling argument is very standard in showing that markov chains mix so essentially what you do is you start out with two distributions on one hand on one hand you have the actual distribution that you will start with that is a point distribution on one state in the on one state in the state space of the markov chain okay and you and in your head you pretend that you're running another markov chain which starts off from a from a state which has been sampled from the stationary distribution itself so since you started from the stationary distribution for the second chain applying the chain many times does not change the stationary distribution okay so that is the second chain that you're sort of running in your head okay then what you do is you couple these two the evolution of these two chains together and what i mean by couple is you sort of run them using the same coin so uh, if 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 we go back to the colorings example uh, to the running of gd so what do i mean by the same coin so what, what is the source of randomness here two places one is that you choose the uh, vertex v uniformly at random this is your first source of randomness and the second is that you choose a color outside the block set uniformly at random okay so these are your two sources of randomness what you do is for both the chains even if they are starting from different states you use the same randomness to run both chains so what do i mean by that is that you update the same vertex okay for both chains and you supply a uniformly random permutation on the set of all colors so uh, a sigma uh, which belongs to a, s sub k okay so you sample a random permutation from s sub k and you supply it to both the chains and then what both the chains will do is they're going to look at the first color Uh, which does not occur in the neighborhood of v and update but see both of these updates they they satisfy two things so they are uh, being updated from the same randomness but if you look at the marginal on each chain if you if you just ignore the other guy it's a honest it's it's an honest to god global dynamics so this is called a coupling okay and it can be shown that what what uh, uh, jerem showed was that uh, using such a coupling if k is greater than 2 delta then eventually the state of the two chains will coalesce now once they have coalesced since uh, that is they collide at the same state okay they update to the same state eventually in 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 polynomial time okay and uh, what this guarantees you is that after coalescence since um yeah since you're running both chains from the same randomness they do not diverge anymore they run with the same thing. and using this argument and some more calculation you can show that actually the distribution of these two chains have also come very close so the distribution of the stationary chain remained the station remained the station distribution but the distribution of the other chain so it started out from a point distribution on one guy and you evolved it many many times so the probability mass sort of spread out and using this argument one shows shows that after this large amount of time that distribution is close so this is the coupling argument and if i have to be very specific it uses the coupling duality that the total variation distance between two distributions is upper bounded by the by the mass that the best coupling puts on the non diagonal elements okay these are uh, these you can sort of check out in standard markov chain theory uh, i i can recommend a good book hackstrom and uh, hackstrom's book it's very nice but uh, that's that was not the question the question was what is the difference between bubli and dar and jerem so jerem did this argument for if any arbitrary pair of states in the state space okay but that is very hard because there are an exponents i mean you 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 have to argue for any arbitrary pair of states you don't know what the hamming distance is between two colorings okay so the state space is colorings and uh, you can take any two possible colorings they might be hamming distance very far apart and uh, you have to argue for that that is a little quite cumbersome 
Bubli and dash showed that okay, you don't have to do that. Take any two colorings which are only having distance one apart. That is, you have one coloring. Let's say again, let's go to the example. You have one coloring. Let's say red, blue, uh, red, blue, green, yellow, and an and another coloring. Let's say yellow, blue, red, blue, green, blue. So these two colorings will only differ at at this vertex having distance one. And if you show expected contraction only for these two guys, then you can show it for all possible pairs of space. That's the that's the difference. Uh, I hope that's clear. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, uh, just just a second. I'll just have a drink of water. Yeah. So now let's move on to perfect sampling. So the question is, can perfect sampling even be done? Because this seems kind of amazing, right? Because you 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 have a you have a set. Which is unstructured. I mean, you don't. You can only test membership for that set. You cannot give me a description for that set. Otherwise, uh, otherwise uh, the hierarchies would be breaking down. Sharp P would fall to P, and nasty things would happen. So, and uh, you're asking me to per sample sample perfectly from a from the uniform distribution of this set, and it's pretty amazing. The point is, uh, is is any kind of perfect sampling possible? And it this was answered by a seminal paper. Uh, Paper by Prop and Wilson in '96, using a technique called CFTP coupling from the past. Okay, I think I'm going very slowly. Anyway, so uh, what? So 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 what is CFTP? Let's see. Where is the diagram? Yes. Okay. So CFTP is the following thing. So you have your usual Markov chain. Uh, let's say uh, this uh, this blob. Uh, this contains five uh, five blue things, right? So this is my let, let's say this is this sort of models a state space for a generic Markov chain. Okay, this models a state space for a generic Markov chain. What CFTP does is the following: CFTP. So in this slide, I'll sort of describe something a little abstractly, but we'll see an a, 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 a specific example very soon. So CFTP will give you independent. Samples of a random update functions from time minus i to times uh, to time minus one. So what does that mean? So the algorithm sub, uh, has its own random coins. It will flip those random coins and it will give you update functions. These are the update functions, Up, and these update functions match map from state space to state space. Okay, but they are sampled randomly. So maybe their assignments are somehow randomly chosen where where each guy goes. Okay. So you you get uh, one sample for the time minus one, another update function for the time minus two, another update function uh, for minus three, blah blah, until minus i. Okay, and what do you do? You apply this this update function to this entire state space, and you look at its image. So yeah, so this uh, yellow bags are the images. Oh sorry, uh, can you just excuse me for just one second? Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so uh, you uh, sort of apply this update function u sub minus i on this yellow blob, which is uh, which is the whole thing. Okay, and it, and it, and you look at its image, and its image is this uh, is suppose the, the, these four terms. Then what you do? You apply u of minus i plus one on just the image of u minus i. Okay, and you look at its image, and you keep on doing. Doing this until time zero, so until time minus one. So at minus one, you apply u of minus one, and, and you look at the image, and you check whether the image is a singleton set. Suppose not, then what do you do? Then you go back. Now, then you go back, as in you go back to some uh, time which is even farther back in the past. Let's say minus capital T. Okay. Uh, now we haven't sampled update functions, so we 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 have update functions from uh, from minus i, I to minus one, but we don't have update functions from minus t to minus i minus one, right? So for minus t to minus i minus one, you have to sample a bunch of new update functions u minus t, u minus t plus one, and so on, and you keep on doing the same thing again. You apply u of minus capital T to the whole range, uh, whole domain, and you look at its range and you apply u of minus t plus one to this green bag now. And so on and so on and so on until the time minus i. At a minus i, 
you you don't have to sample any new randomness anymore. You have to reuse the randomness that you had the, the random functions that you had sampled previously. And as you can see, in this case, you, you essentially keep on doing the same thing. Okay. So now you don't track the yellow bags, you'll keep track, 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 tracking the green bags. And we were fortunate in this case, this green bag indeed ended up as a singleton sample. And if you have a singleton, you output the singleton. And the claim is that this singleton is actually uh, distributed according to, so I, this is some overloaded notation here, according to uh, the stationary distribution of whatever Markov chain you are simulating or whatever um, Markov chain uh, whose state space this is. Okay? This is the this is the CFTP algorithm. That's it. That you have to reuse randomness and check and if not singleton, go back, sample some more and so on and so on. So, on, so, on. so one thing that one should notice is that when you go farther back, uh, the images that you get when you come back to a time that you have seen before is a subset of uh, the image that you had previously. So what do I mean by that is uh, on in our first pass, we had this yellow blob, which had only four elements. But when you went back and you came forward, since you're reusing randomness, since you're reusing this, these uh, u minus i, u minus i plus one guys, whatever you're going to see here for the second pass is going to be a subset of whatever was there in the first pass. So this is very clear in the example, this green bag is a subset of the blue bag. Okay. Uh, what this means is once you get, have gotten a singleton sample, there's no point in going back any farther. Because if, even if you go back farther, once you reach this point, you will have to use the same, same U of minus T and so on and so on again, and you will end up at the same guy. There, so this is a one, one very, very important point. So let's see a concrete example. A very simple walk. This is a walk on one to five. Okay. And you go left with probability half, right with probability half. And at the edges, you essentially be lazy. With probability half, you be lazy. Okay. It's easy to see that the, the stationary distribution of this is uh, the uniform distribution. Uh, but uh, how do you produce a uniformly random sample from this? So. I mean, one of you might say, what the hell? This is this trivial. You can just flip a five-sided coin and output a, a uniformly random sample. I say, yeah, but this is for demonstration purposes only. So, oh, sorry. So, so yeah, so the state space is precisely this one, two, three, four, five. And you start with, let's, let's say we started here. You, you started with, uh, or maybe, oh no. Okay, well, let's start here. So you started with U of minus T. Now, what is u of minus t in this case? Uh, all of these guys, all of these update functions for this particular case, they are real numbers sampled independently and uniformly and at random between zero and one, okay? Across time, independent across time and uh, identically distributed uniformly between zero and one. So the update rule is that if your, if your blue dot, if your number is, uh, sorry, 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 if at time t, uh, if the this this number this tau the tau of minus t if it is uh, greater than half then whatever number that your update function is updating if your u is updating you add a plus one and if tau is less than half then you sub then you subtract a one okay uh, that's that's just it and you can see that sort of you know all of the update function either will add a plus one to all of the guys or add a minus one to all of the guys. And you can sort of imagine that uh, quickly enough, all of them will coalesce to a single state. If you go back farther enough, all of them will coalesce to a single state. Okay. Um, yeah. So questions about uh, this, this is the um, CFTP algorithm. Now I'll sort of give an idea about the proof, but uh, questions about this, this is very important. Uh, sorry, I have a question. So yeah. your update yeah. was that all of them go in the same direction. Is that uh, how? Yeah. The yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So the definition of the update function is just this: what the the thing that is written in red, that if you're when the update function is updating j, uh, j is one of these guys. Mm -hmm. J is with one, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. When you're updating j, uh -huh. uh, this function will look at tau. So it's a randomized function. It outputs a distribution, but let's not say it like that. So uh, it looks at tau. If tau is greater than half, the output j prime will be j plus one. And if the if tau tau at time t is less than half, then the output is j minus one. And this is for all j between one to five. So the That's, last one will stay there, of course. So what you mean is, uh, but 
Uh, the last one might not stay there if tau tau is less than half, right? It might like if 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 you're up. Well, last tau. means one of the two sides. Right? Yes, so yes, then, yes, yes. Uh, one of the two sides side will stay there. Uh, that is so, but uh, what uh, my question is? So the general definition of update function is that for each fixed digit, it has to respect the transition probability if you average over the. Oh right, right, right. So so is when that I, what it is? Yeah, yeah. So that update function is for the Markov chains update. Okay. I'm sort of abusing notation and parlance here. I mean, Why? okay, so oh, okay, okay, okay. So so let me let me be very clear in what I'm saying. So this chain, let's let's look at the evolution of one 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 particular guy. Okay, this is actually is let's say let's take the evolution of J. So what was the actual chain? What was the update of the actual chain? You you flipped a coin. If you if you came up with heads, you went uh, right, and if you came up with tail, you went left. Now notice that that is that is precisely what is happening at at this j. If you no, that's correct. But that's yeah, correct. the different j are coupled. My question is, uh -huh. I could also pick a random function where each for each j it is randomly j plus minus one independent. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yes, yes, you can do that. You can do that. But that is going to be very okay. okay. Inefficient. But that's an uh, I, that's a legal that, one, right? That, that's legal. That is completely legal. Okay. That is absolutely legal, but the problem is that you cannot guarantee coalescence in that case. Okay. Okay. Fine. So I'll get to this point. It's that's a great question. Thank you. I'll 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 get to this point in in just a minute. In fact, in one slide. So some 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 comments about CFT. I think these comments I've already made. So let's move on to the next slide. So what is the intuition of correctness? Okay. So uh, a lot of math people are here. So let me give some. outlandishly wrong intuition first and then i'll give you a sort of hand wavy proof okay so the intuition is the following so suppose what would you have to do to guarantee the guarantee that the sample was perfectly distributed according to the stationary distribution you would have you would have to have the guarantee that uh, the uh, markov chain itself was ergodic otherwise you cannot guarantee that in the limit Uh, the distribution that that you get is the same as the stationary distribution you cannot guarantee that if if it's not a, a, a ergodic that's one thing and the second thing is once you're told that it's ergodic you sort of think in your head run this for infinite amount of time and uh, output the sample at infinity okay so that's the intuition that's all there is but this is mathematically completely insensible i mean what do you mean run for infinite time and CFTP is doing something entirely different. It's running from minus infinity to zero. So you might say that okay, you know, instead of running from zero to infinity, since you want to actually update uh, output something, you change your uh, uh, frame of reference and you sort of slide everything back by minus infinity again. Mathematically, that that doesn't make any sense, but yeah, sort of intuitively, you see what I'm trying to say here. You start at minus infinity and you come to zero. and uh, since you have been running for infinite time you know that uh, the guy at zero uh, that everybody ha has coalesced at zero and the distribution of this random variable is precisely exactly the stationary distribution and that is very hand wavy but effective uh, intuition but if i have to do a precise proof what do i say so i need some guarantees the first guarantee i need is that my update rule has to make sense that is my update rule has to coalesce and writing this down in in a statement means that this stopping time so this t if i define it as a stopping time so how do i define it i will say that uh, t is the first time such that if i run the chain for t for from 0 to t for, or rather from minus t to 0 we will see coalescence that is my definition of stopping time okay and we need this guarantee that with uh, that uh, the stopping time is finite all, almost surely so i did not want to say say this word but yeah i'm just going to say this here if any of you don't know what i'm saying it's completely fine don't have to think about it so t has to be finite almost surely now if t is finite that means that uh, going back remember that that particular piece of intuition that once you have a finite t for which coalescence has happened you need not go back any further because if you even if you go back for, further the thing is going to uh, going to coalesce to the same sample okay now what does this uh, almost sure finiteness by by you it tells you that if you take the limit of x minus t as t tends to infinity that limit exists almost surely so the exist t being finite almost surely guarantees the existence of of this limit x minus infinity okay so the, the that's okay that's great 
But uh, what is the distribution of X minus infinity? I, I haven't said anything about that yet. And that is where this other thing of ergodicity comes in. That, you know, if I, if I run the chain for an infinite amount of time, then this X minus infinity or X infinity, whatever, these two are distributed the same way. Uh, they converge in distribution. So not, not almost surely, they converge in distribution to a random variable, which is distributed exactly according to pi. These two facts combined together essentially guarantees the correctness of the algorithm. Okay. I hope that is sort of clear to the experts. I'm not, I don't want to stay on this for too long. Any questions about this? Uh, okay. Okay. If there are no what questions. What is the general statement? I mean, what, when does it happen? Is there a simple statement you can make? Yeah. The simple statement is that given an update rule. So this is how the update rule business comes in. Give, given an update rule. Uh, mm -hmm. So, or, or rather I should say given a grant coupling. So this, this is uh, this is a grant coupling. Because this, this update function acts on everyone in the state space. Uh -huh. So given a grand coupling, which ensures that the stopping time is finite almost surely, uh, the CFTP algorithm will output uh, in finite time a sample, mm -hmm. okay. sample, which is distributed exactly according to the stationary distribution of the underlying Markov chain. That's it. That's the statement. Okay. So this almost sureness and the, oh, right. And, and also assuming that the underlying chain is ergodic. So ergodicity and the almost sureness of the, uh, almost sure convergence, sorry, uh, the almost sure finiteness of this stopping time is, uh, uh, these two things are very important. Other than that, it's all uh, easy calculations. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a wet floor sign here. And the reason is that there are a lot of subtle things in this proof. I mean, there are, there have been many times when we have thought, ah, oh, we understand propulsion and then somebody comes up with a counter example and one should spend some time on this that's that's all i'm going to say about it. Uh, any more questions okay so if there aren't any more questions i'll just move on so what are we interested in we are not interested in doing any measure theory here uh, this has been already given to us this is there okay we are interested in efficiency that is, this, uh, the, the expected stopping time not only needs to be finite for us, for us it's ne it needs to be small in the sense it needs to be polynomial in the size of the un uh, underlying problem. Okay, that is, that is what one needs to ensure, that you cannot go back an exponentially many number of times. You can only go back polynomially many number of times. You can't say that, okay, you know, it will... Uh, it will output a sample eventually with probability one. So you are done. No, that does not guarantee efficiency. Effic efficiency asks something even stronger. We can, is that, uh, is your uh, stopping time on expectation? Is, is it only polynomial? So that is, that is what we need. So, uh, what are the issues with coloring? So for actually, before going to color coloring, let me go to this next slide or the toy example, then it will be easier to understand. So. Let's let's look at the easy walk on one to five. Okay, going left and going right with probability half each. What the issue is that when you're running this on a computer, you need to keep track of all, all of the evolutions of all of these guys. So each individual Markov chain, you need to be able to track. Now, this is hard. If you're uh, let's say for for colorings itself, the the state space is exponential size, right? Some two to the n some or to the order and or something. Uh, so you will obviously not be able to track the evolution of every possible state in, in the domain uh, for every function, uh, because that, 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 that will need exponential amount of memory. So here is an example where this, this sort of a problem can be sort of circumvented. So notice that because of the way we had defined the grand coupling here, that is the update function, uh, as was as Yogeshwaran observed previously, that everybody goes in the same direction. Either everybody goes below or everybody. Or everybody go, goes, goes above. Once again, something is wrong with my computer. So uh, the point is that, um, yeah. So the point is that you need only keep track of the borders. You only keep track of one and five and you're guaranteed that everybody else is sandwiched in between. So once you're here, you check whether one and five lead to the same state at, at, at time zero. 
If so, you are done. So this sort of an ordering in the natural ordering in the state space helps a lot. Okay, but for colorings, there is no 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 natural ordering. So we have we 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 have problems. And as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, the number of uh, guys in the state space are two to the n, which is itself very problematic. On top of that, um, yeah. So let's let's get one thing clear. How how would a grand coupling look like in the case of colorings? So as I mentioned earlier, again, you essentially uh, uh, each update function, or, or or rather each each bit of randomness that we provide here consists of two things. One is the vertex, a randomly chosen vertex v i. And another is a permutation on the set of all, all colors. Okay, so we provide this to this function, and the function look looks at which vertex to update, and it will up, update only that vertex for every state. Okay, and what else will it do for one particular coloring chi? Let's say let's say this this blue dot chi, which is denoted by red. What it'll do is at v, it will look at this random per permutation, and it will sort of pick up the first color. Which does not occur among the neighbors of V. So the neighbors are occupied by red and uh, red and blue. So the first color that does not occur is yellow. So it recolors this uh, V with yellow. And this happens for every chi. This is done. This update is done for every chi using the same randomness sigma and V. Okay. So this is this is the grand coupling for for, for colorings, and it's and it's very easy to see that actually you know you what you're. From this process, what you are actually doing is picking a uniformly random color from the set k minus chi of uh, chi of uh, this neighborhood, chi of n v. Okay. So these are these are the issues and the problems. So how did how does one uh, solve these problems for colorings? How did how did Huber solve it? And Huber's great solution was that this concept of a bounding chain. So the philosophy is you give up some information. But what you get back in in return is a polynomial size structure which you can store in memory, but which essentially ca captures every possible coloring that you have uh, in have in your uh, state space currently. Okay. Now, before going into bounding chains, let 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 me give some salient features. Sir. Bounding chains are efficient. Okay, they ch check efficiently. And they don't have any false positives, as in they don't output a coloring and say that okay, this is not the proper coloring. That that thing, that sort of thing, cannot happen. Okay. And another thing which we proved in our paper is, uh, and in fact Huber proved, is that for large k and t something like order n log n times delta, delta can be anything. It can be of the order n or it can be constant also. It can range in between. Then the probability that uh, the CFTP algorithm. For bounding chains, for adapted suitably for bounding chains, coalesces uh, for this time for this t is greater than half. So on expectation, you expect to repeat the CFTP algorithm only twice. Okay, so these are very nice features. Now, what is a bounding chain exactly? So a bounding chain is a list, uh, is is a bunch of lists actually, is a collection of lists. And what it does is a bounding chain does is that at every vertex v. It will assign a list of colors. Okay, at every vertex of the graph, it will assign a list of colors. Why? The point is that suppose let, let me just go back to this picture. Suppose at time this whatever this time is, I think it's i minus two. There are one, two, three, four. There are only these four guys. In the image of your CFTP algorithm, remember there was there were these bags that I had drawn, bag uh, green and yellow and all sorts of things. So a subset of the entire set, maybe. Okay. So there are these colorings which are the subset, uh, which is the proper subset of the entire set, and you arrived here by by uh, applying update functions many many times. Just 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 keep 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 that in mind. So what a bounding chain does is these lists. So let's say. That that back at that time uh, i minus two it has the coloring sky one sky two sky three sky four for for our purposes that's that's good enough okay so these four colorings will assign different colors or maybe same colors at at each vertex but at least there is at least one vertex where any two colorings uh, differ that is easy enough to see the bounding list 
at the at any vertex let's say at this vertex will contain every possible color that all of these chi1 chi2 chi3 chi4 could have assigned to this vertex that's what it does it sort of contains all the information or all the colors that are possible at that time at that vertex given the evolution of the cftp algorithm up till that time is this clear so suppose that even not chi1 chi2 chi3 chi4 let's say chi1 and chi2 we had two colorings chi1 and chi2 in my image uh, and i have evolved up till that time and only, i only have chi1 and chi2 left okay say chi1 gave a blue here and chi2 gave a green here and maybe let's make it a little complicated chi3 gave a yellow as you can see the bounding chain contains all three colors so this is the this is this is an invariant that we have to maintain that at any point of time in during the run of your cftp algorithm whatever colorings are there in the image in the current image of your cftp algorithm and whatever colors those colorings assign at every vertex have to be contained in the lists at those particular vertices this is the containment property or the invariant okay is this bit clear any questions about this because this is sort of like the bedrock of what we do okay okay so if there are no questions and this is essentially what i have written in complicated math notation here is that the image up of of uh, the updates up until time t minus 1 of the grand coupling up until time t minus 1 from the time capital minus t is contained in the lists of the bounding chain at every vertex at time t okay uh, but notice that the bounding chain is a polynomial size size object because you 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 don't need more than de more than de delta plus one colors right you you don't need no more than delta plus one colors so at most you can have something like poly in n and delta plus one so you can store this thing in memory but what it buys you is that uh, instead of keeping track of an exponentially many number of colorings you can only keep track of this one object which you can store in memory eff efficiently okay and the great thing is once this image for every vertex once this these lists shrink down to size 1 you are done because you know by the invariant by this containment property that if each of these lists contain a contains a single color then the bounding chain can only contain one possible coloring and that possible coloring is precisely the coloring that your uh, cftp algorithm would have output okay so this is uh, this is huber's idea okay so questions one question there yeah, so yeah, the yeah. capital t was fixed and you are in indexing by small t is it i mean what is uh, so this bc sub t yeah yeah ha, yes so, so uh, there is some notational issues here we are indexing with small t yes so this time is negative so this t is negative okay just think of it as a negative time so it started from minus capital t and it went up till some other negative time okay right right that and, is okay uh, but yeah. what i mean is so the capital t is fixed the capital t is fixed yes so so that is fixed in the in Hu in huber's theorem itself that capital t is order of n n log n times oh. delta okay okay so let's move on so what was huber's idea huber's idea was to keep keep track of such a bounding chain theek okay? hai instead of keeping track of all of the colorings keep track of the bounding chain and you have to update the bounding chain obviously using the same randomness that you would provide to the underlying chain to this to these underlying update functions right so how do we do that do those updates that i'll uh, sort of go over now so huber's algorithm uh, has two phases the first phase you want to find him writing in this way this is our understanding of the thing so the first phase is called the warm up phase and it it lasts for something like n log n time we will see why why n log n and the second phase is what we call the coalescence phase and that is where this n n log n times delta business comes in so at at the wave at the very beginning at time minus t what does huber do he takes the set of all possible colors that is square square brackets k let's say in this say for this example it's 5 or maybe it could be more but we couldn't fit any more in this slide so let's say it's 5 so at every vertex assign that entire list of colors okay so at time minus t the invariant is by default tri trivially satisfied what happens after that 
you pick a vertex uniformly at random so look at your update you you look you look at that vertex uniformly at random for, on on the bounding chain remember that the bounding chain and the underlying stuff have to be updated using the same randomness so that is one important thing to keep in mind so you pick a vertex uniformly at random and uh, what you do is you look at the first delta plus 1 uh, colors in this uh, in this random permutation so so suppose your random permutation was this black yellow blue red and green so for this graph delta plus 1 is 4 because the max degree is 3 so you look at the first four colors and since you are updating v you chuck out this list that was previously there and you update the list using these first four colors okay yeah? this is this keeps happening for n log n time why n log n because by the coupon collector problem with very very high probability in fact doubly ex exponential probability by the coupon collector you can say that uh, if you have uh, sampled if you have picked vertices uniformly at random for this amount of time almost uh, uh, all of the vertices have been picked at least once so that means that all of the vertices of the graph with very very high probability have been updated to a list of size delta plus 1 now the question is how does this uh, how does this uh, satisfy the invariant that is very easy to see because you see since the degree of the graph the max degree of the graph is 3 but at every vertex you are assigning a random list of colors of size delta plus 1 there is for any chi for any for any chi that is contained in the images of the update functions let's say take 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 an arbitrary chi let's say let's take this chi okay you will always find in this bounding list at at v at that time at least one color which is not occupying any of its neighbors precisely because this, this is greater than the degree of the graph greater than the max degree of the graph for example in this example so remember we had updated v to black yellow blue and red and uh, we see that uh, red and blue to yahan pe hai red and blue are here but black is the first color which uh, does not appear so uh, right at the very beginning we were lucky and this is the first color and we can update directly okay so you so the containment property the invariant is always satisfied this is this is one very important thing at least due due during the coalescence phase now uh, the coalescence phase ends after after n log n time what happens after that yeah. so now oh sorry, sorry sorry yeah sorry yeah yeah, yeah we could uh, maybe move some of this stuff to the second talk oh sure 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 we no could take a short break and let's meet at 3:30 again yeah yeah sure sure no and then we're going to start here okay, right. okay so i'm stopping the share now okay, so Okay, so so the so the warm up phase again. Uh, so what is the warm up phase? So Huber's algorithm, as I said, uh, runs in two phases. One one is warm up, and the other is coalescence. And I was wrongly saying coalescence ended, coalescence ended just a few minutes ago. So you warm up ended. That's what I meant. Anyway, so what is the warm up phase? It it lasts for a fixed time n log n. Okay, so this is hard coded. This n log n for some order n log n maybe two two three times n log n. This this is hard coded into the algorithm. and what it does is at the very beginning what happens at at time minus t at minus t the algor the algorithm will give the bounding chain uh, at at every vertex the bounding chain will fix a list of size k so basically all the colors okay and uh, i mean you really can't do anything else because you at, at at this point of time nothing has happened so so this is the only thing that you can do and you hope that as time go goes along the size of these lists shrink so in the warm up phase what happens is uh, let's let's look at the let's look at the prescription of the randomness so you, the algorithm looks at the random vertex and at for every chi it will uh, yeah for every, for every chi it, it will update uh, the graph at that vertex okay but update it how so it will look at uh, it, it will essentially go to v completely chuck out this k size list and it will look at the first delta plus 1 entries in this random permutation on the on, on the set of colors sigma okay so sigma minus i at time minus i or whatever so uh, for for a for a concrete example let's say this sigma minus i was black yellow blue red and green and since the max degree of this graph is 3 uh, we want to we want to only retain the first four of these colors which is black black to red okay 
So the update for any kind, for if, or rather for for a, uh, what am I saying? The update for the bounding chain is that at V this list is chucked out, this case size list is chucked out, and the new list is th these four colors. Okay. Now why does this phase go on for n log n time? Because by coupon collector, we know that with very high probability, after some two or three times n log n, uh, all the vertices have been updated. So, so with very high probability, you can expect that all the vertices have a list of size delta plus one, and in this case, four. So the same process happens at every, every vertex. So now what has happened? Every vertex no longer has uh, a list carrying every possible color. It has a list uh, carrying only delta plus one colors. Now the question is, is the invariant painted? During the entire warm-up phase, phase, is the invariant painted? And the answer is obviously yes, because, because of the degree constraint. So since the degree of the, let's, uh, let's say that uh, you take any chi, which is in the image of the updates at some, some time t prime, uh, minus t prime, uh, sometime t here, okay, t in, in the middle during the warm-up phase. And we look at some specific coloring chi, which is in the image at that time, okay? So what we have to ensure is that uh, this sort of an update uh, keeps uh, the updated chi in, uh, contained in the bounding chain, right? That, that, that was the invariant. And how do we see, see that that will happen? So what happens is the bounding chain is, uh, has appended a list of size delta plus one, that is four at V, right? But, uh, and, and, but what is the individual update of chi? What, so what does Kai see? Kai doesn't know about any, anyone else. What does Kai see? Kai sees that, okay, I'm going to update V, great. And how am I go going to update V? I'm going to look at the random permutation sigma and I'm going to update my V with the first color that I see, which does not occupy my neighbors. So that first co color is black. Great. So this bl black appears in, in, the, in the first four colors itself. The question is, is this always the case? So will there always be a free color for every chi in the image to update the vertex width? And the answer is yes, because the max degree of, of the graph is three and we are updating these vertices with uh, a list of size four. So there is always one color which is free, okay? So uh, this, uh, this, yeah, so, so this is the warm-up phase. One thing is, so somewhere in the middle of the warm-up phase itself, every vertex color list would be updated. Yes, yes, with high probability. And then it remains the same. That random set of colors will be forever for it. Not, the, quite, not quite, right? You, you, can, you can get updated. So, so since we are picking the vertices randomly, it may just happen. That, and in fact, it will happen because you're picking for n log n times that one vertex which has been updated with a list of size delta plus one before has to be up, up, updated again. But since, oh, since okay, you're... every time you pick it, you will again update the yes, uh, yes. Uh, colors it, for it. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Using using the random sigma that is given along with the prescription for that vertex. Okay. 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 So this is this is the warm-up phase. Now, what happens in the coalescence phase? So after the warm-up phase ends, so let's say after this uh, n log n amount of time or some two, three n log n amount of time, we will start the coalescence phase. Now this phase is different. See, in the warm-up phase, we did not take any, we made progress, but not considerable. We made progress from K size lists to delta plus one size lists. Okay, so what? We need to say that actually, you know, uh, we, we, we want each list size to go down to one. Okay. So how, how does Huber do that? Huber says that at inside, a, inside the coalescence phase, at time, t, again, let's say we are updating the vertex. So throughout this presentation we will be only uh, we will only be updating vertex v <laughs> so suppose that we are updating the vertex v you look at the bound the current state of the bounding chain now the current state of the bounding chain might look like this so some of so some of the vertices might have lists of size 1 and the others might have lists uh, lists of size strictly greater than 1 for so take this example okay so this guy has a list of size 4 this guy has a list of size 3 v itself has a list of size 4 so what happens when you're updating V, again, this current list will be chucked out. So at where, whatever you're updating, the current list is chucked out. It's the same as coloring. You rub out the current color and you look at Sigma. You start looking at Sigma. Okay. Let's say Sigma is this, this, 
red to blue red green uh, black yellow blue thing okay and what does the algor uh, what does the algorithm do it will it will it will see red it will check if any of these neighbors has red okay it will check that if it sees that uh, the red is present in any of the neighbor lists so for example red is present in all of the neighbors lists it will update the it will put red in the new list again then it will move on to green it will again check whether any of the neighbors lists has green if yes add it to the list so now the list has red and green after that what let's say black so uh, it will look at black and it will check if any of the neighbors has the color black no okay so then what happens is black is entered into the list and that is and we move on to the next update so the moment the algorithm finds a color in the permutation which does not appear in any of the neighbors lists you update the list with that color and say okay this is the last update i am done i am moving on to the next update okay this is designed in this way because uh, to uh, so that it uh, maintains the invariant i mean you, you you can tell right so the induction hypothesis is that at at this time at this current time minus i or whatever uh, this bounding chain contains the possible color assignments of all possible colorings that is contained in the image uh, of the cftp at that time now i have to update now when i update i have to maintain that in invariant how do i maintain that invariant so if i see a color which appears in any of the neighbors lists i cannot discard it <clears throat> i i precisely cannot discard it because because it may happen uh, that uh, actually red appears in the on the neighbors but red is not used amongst any of the color rings that this guy contains that might just happen so you can't discard it but you can't use it either you can't say you can't say that okay red is the only color that i will use you can't end it there why because again it may happen that one of one of the colorings colors the neighbors with the red so this is problematic so neither can you throw away red nor can you just end the list at red you have to move on to the next color but what why is black so special what makes black so special the special property is that black does not appear in any of the neighbor list that means that none of the colorings that the bounding chain contains at this time contains the color black on any of the neighbors of blue so black is indeed a legitimate color with which this this vertex can be updated and once we have one legitimate color we are done so that's the update okay and you can check that uh, again uh, yourself that the invariant is actually is is actually maintained okay so what is the best case for us the best case is if this black came at the very beginning if the black came at the very beginning then the list size of v whatever the list size it was before maybe it was 2 maybe it was 1 the list size becomes 1 so that is definitely progress but if 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 uh, we get this kind of a guy where red and green ca come first then uh, it's not really progress because the list size ha ha has increased and potentially can go up to delta plus 1 potentially it can go up to delta plus 1 so the point is the intuition is that you know if your k is large if your set of all colors is large then so let us call so this this quantity seems important right the union of the lists of the neighbors of so union will be what blue green red uh, yellow blue uh, blue green uh, red yellow so this is the union so we we will call this stv so this is a typo this should be v so we will call this union set stv so the intuition is that if k is much larger than stv then there are many colors outside and with some good probability we we make progress but if stv becomes large as compared to k then is true then with high probability you will get something like this you are not making any progress so what huber showed uh, was that uh, so this is some uh, measure of progress so what is the measure of progress that this wt quantity is the number of uh, vertices at time t uh, which have lists of size 1 that's that's my measure of progress so i want this wt to be equal to n at time 0 that's when i can declare that my cftp has ended okay um and if you write down some equations with respect to this measure of progress and write down the correct probabilities you will see that if k greater than delta square plus 2 delta for huber scheme 
then if you set uh, if you set this the length of uh, the coalescence phase to be n log n times delta, then with probability at least half, in fact, strictly greater than half, uh, the images of your updates will have coalesced to a single time. So on expectation, you will only have to run it twice. Okay. So this is Huber's algorithm. But where is the weakness in this? The weakness in this is that is this STV quantity. So this is the this is the this thing, this max list size during during coalescence. For Huber, this is delta plus one. This is worst case delta plus one because, like I said, you can encounter a bad permutation which has the first delta colors of which appear in its neighbor's lists. So that is a very bad case, and you have to append a list of delta plus one. So that's the worst case, and Huber does a worst case analysis. What we do is we bring down this guy to two. Instead of delta plus one, we bring this down to two. And that is where we really, really make, make our savings. And you can see that that is precisely where we get k greater than two delta plus delta, which is three, which is three delta. So, so uh, one thing yeah. that second delta there. Yeah, so so this comes this comes because of some technical reason. There, there, there is some, some probability un, uh, unaccounted for, which you need to account for in your equations. And that will always stay there. You can't really do anything about this. Okay, delta. but the first, I mean, the product delta is yeah, this can be improved. This delta square can be this product. So essentially, if you break this down, what is this? Delta plus one times delta plus delta, hmm. right? Delta okay. plus one times delta plus delta. So that addi additive delta, you can't really do anything about. That's a, that's a byproduct of uh, some very standard analysis. And at least I don't know whether we can do anything about it. And if you can solve that, I think you will be able to improve approximate sampling to delta plus one. Approximate sampling is still stuck at some constant times delta. If you could improve the additive delta, you could possibly do delta plus constant. So that is a huge open problem. So we are not even going to go there. But what can be improved is this delta plus one times delta. So multiplicative delta plus one, that is worst case. And our what the question that we ask is, yeah, why delta plus one? Why not two? Why not one? And we will see that that can actually be done. That is where we get all our savings. Okay, so yeah. So in our chain, what we do is the following. So our chain also has two phases. Okay. So by the way, the the, the treatment that I'm going to do it will be sort of high level, and some things I'm going to lie about because otherwise the talk would blow up too much. But uh, please bear with me. So our bounding chain also has two phases: a warm up phase and a coalescence phase. Okay. So before talking about the chain, I want to introduce two primitives that we use. And those two primitives are the heart of everything that we do. So one primitive is called the contract kind of update and the other primitive is called the complex kind of update. Those we'll see in the next slide. But the salient features are the following, that what was the guarantee at the end of Huber's form of phase? The guarantee was that with very high probability, very, very doubly exponentially high probability, uh, every list size, was delta plus one. We guarantee that at the end of our warm up phase, every list size is two with probability one, not very, very high with probability one. So we ensure this that every list has size two. TK, good. Now what? So you have list size two, but if you do Huber kind of updates, your list sizes can blow up again. Who's stopping you, your list sizes from blowing up? So there, here is another guarantee that in the coalescence phase, Every list size, not only do the list sizes stay two, but they can also go down to one with some non-trivial probability. Okay, that is that is the coalescence phase, and we show that uh, for k greater than this this improvement three delta, uh, the same Huber kind of thing that with probability strictly greater than half, uh, the measure of progress w t at at zero that is w zero with uh, with probability strictly greater than half is of size n. Okay. So that is the general plan of the, and the main idea is sort of changing the underlying process, which we, which we will see, see now. And as I mentioned, two types of updates, compress and contract. So I will describe the contract update. Okay. And uh, this will take some, this is, this is the meat of the paper, the, this, this slide and the next slide this is the main idea of the paper. Everything else you can sort of learn off on your own, but this is the main thing. So let's let's ask this question. Why do we need delta plus one size lists? Why can't we do something which is completely crazy? Maybe completely crazy. Let's see. So let's take one fixed coloring, which is in the image. Okay. Let's call that, call that coloring chi. Huh? 
and we have our bounding chain at time t and i'm going to draw so and this this big oval the black oval is the set of all colors okay so if, if everybody with me here this black thing is the set of all colors and i have fixed uh, i am considering some arbitrary uh, color ring specific color ring in the image okay uh, and all my arguments will go forth for any coloring that is in the image that's that's the idea that's the idea that we have been carrying so far so what is this set what is this s guy this red guy this is the stv that i had defined earlier it is precisely at the vertex v so again we are only looking at vertex v so at the vertex v it is the union of all the lists of the neighbors of v so these are the colors okay so that's the, that's the red set what is t i have not defined t before so t is a set which the bounding chain does not have access to see i we are running we are only able, able to run the bounding chain on our computers but underlying i idealistically there is an actual cftp running which the bounding chain captures right but we don't have access to, to that cftp we can only argue about it theoretically so for this guy so this t is a function of this guy okay what is t t is precisely the set of colors that are blocking v that 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 is the colors that are occupying the neighbors of v with respect to this coloring type so t is shorthand for chi and v okay but obviously the bounding chain does not have access to this set the bounding chain does not know what the set is so let's do something crazy let's say the bounding chain says i will not do anything i will pick a color c1 uniformly at random from the set k, k uh, uh, from the set uh, k minus s okay just just pick this color c1 from the set from the set k minus s so this c1 does not appear in any of the bounding lists it is guaranteed to be a usable color at uh, at v for every coloring contained in the image great great till now great where where do things go wrong remember that we need for every coloring that is contained in the image for example chi we need the update to look like a proper global global dynamics update we can't can't have a we can't suddenly have a very weird kind kind of update which depends on s chi does not care for s i mean what is s for chi nothing chi needs an up, a color needs to update v with a color which is picked uniformly at random from the set k minus t that is the issue so the issue is that chi needs to be able to update its its color the the color at v with a color which is sampled uniformly at random from the set k minus t and remember this t is specific to chi this uh, t is a function of chi okay so we are in trouble because if you only specify c1 then you are not putting enough mass in on s minus t so this annular region there are many there might be many colors in this annular, annular region there is no mass on them so single single list link chalega okay maybe list of size 2 let's see so suppose that we have list of size 2 uh, uh, let's say that can we do this of size two? so what do, what do we do we pick a c1 so the the bounding chain picks a c1 from outside of s that is from k minus s uar and it also picks a c2 uar from inside s only s so the bounding chain can't tell whether Uh, it came from inside t uh, from the annular region or from inside t so it just picks the color and produces this list and that's all the bounding chain does okay now what does chi do so chi has to somehow do some sort of its own processing its own coupling with this list so this list is passed down to chi right the bounding chain passes down this list to chi and chi has to do its own, own process so remember that this process that we just did uh we did some weird sort of sampling Uh, and there are only two guys here so we have to kai has to make it look like the updated color um came uniformly at random from k minus t so to do that we do the following algorithm which we call by sampling so kai looks at c1 and kai flips a coin with probability of hex p if hex kai says okay i'll 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 color v with c1 great if tails Kai checks C two. If C two lies in this annular region, then it is usable, and Kai will use it. Okay. If C two lies in the annular region, it's outside of the block set, 
so it's usable and kai and kai says okay i'll update with c2 but suppose it is not usable suppose it lies inside t. the bounding chain does not know what t is right so it can lie very it can very well lie inside t it can very well come from inside this kai it can be a block color so in that case kai cannot use c2 so what does he do he has no other choice but to you go back to c1 and use c1 and what we need to ensure is that this randomized algorithm puts we can we need to ensure that we can tweak the value of p such that the probability is on c2 and c1 appear to be 1 over uh, size of k minus size of t that's what we need to do and how do we do that simply by writing down this very simple equation so see notice something that we picked from uniform distributions over k minus s and s right so the actual distribution from which the bounding chain is picking these colors is a uh, is a convex combination between the two so if we ensure that uh, c2 is uh, that a color from s minus t is picked with probability s minus t over k minus t then everything else works out okay because of the uniform because everything else has been picked uniformly from the correct sets etc et et so we only have to write one equation i mean so to uh, clarify c1 is picked also uniformly at random from k minus yes 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 from from k minus s from k minus s the point is c1 is picked uniformly from k minus s and c2 is picked uniformly from from s okay and then we use this probability to create a weird sort of uh, convex co co combination uh, distribution and we must and and we sort of ensure ensure that the value of p is such that this combination convex combination leads to the uniform distribution of k minus t how do we do that so let's let's see so what is the probability that c2 is accepted so let's break down the events c2 is accepted means that the first coin came up tails so 1 minus t and then the color c2 would have to have been sampled from among these s minus t guys so s minus t divided by s so this is this this lhs is the probability that the algorithm assigns to assigns to c2 or or rather anybody in this annular region okay but this has to be precisely equal to if you're picking uniformly at random this has to be precisely equal to s minus t divided by k minus t that is the total probability of this entire region okay so this is a very simple equation and once you solve this equation you see that the condition you need for p to exist for p to be a bona fide probability is k is greater than size of s plus delta you can also write a similar equation for c1 but as i said that is not necessary because of the uniform nature of the sample and all okay if you fix p for this guy then everything else is fixed automatically great but is this is still not satisfactory this is this is still bad for us why because what did we what did we just see we just saw that uh, uh, okay we can get it down to size 2 with this kind of a k but uh, we are not getting it down any further are we how are we making any progress right so progress is not happening so let so let's slowly build up to the, to it so in the uh, uh, yeah so this is the this is one example of the contract update so that uh, you have the c2 this is this thing in the middle the set in the middle that is your s as you can see that is like a red a red blue and green and red and blue are inside the block set chi and v which is t and every thing outside is uh, k minus s okay so it, it turns out that in this particular iteration of the algorithm c1 and c1 is outside and c2 c2 is also good c2 is also outside the block set and the algorithm can use either so what is the specification of the contract update in the paper the specification the randomness that you give to the algorithm is sigma is there the the random uh, vertex is also there but along with that you have to provide a real number sampled uniformly between 0 and 1 and the thing and the catch is that uh, you have some threshold p which we will sort of calculate from this equation from this equation we'll calculate the threshold p and if your tau lies above that threshold you say your coin came tail and below that threshold your your coin came head or maybe yeah yeah, the, yeah that's that's the intuition okay that's how we specify the update but uh, what happens next oh so suppose that let's make a nice assumption that in our 
in a, in our coalesce instance, let's make the following assumption that all the lists are of size two. Like I said, we will ensure. I I'll tell you how we ensure that. But let's say that uh, that is there. Then by this condition that k is greater than size of s plus delta, since every list is of size two by the promise, and we are in the in in the in the coalesce space. So every list is of size two, and the max degree is delta. K only need be greater than two delta. So K K needs two delta plus delta. So K, if K is greater than three delta, then we can at least ensure that two size lists remain two size lists. They they don't blow up again. That's great. But we don't make progress either. So how do we ensure that we can make progress? So remember, why did we need to go to two size lists in the first place? Because the bounding chain does not know whether this C one will be used. How can the bounding chain sort of uh, look ahead and so uh, like be a not even look ahead, like be a clairvoyant and know what uh, this value, what this coin came out to be? And in fact, the bounding chain can't even uh, look at a single coin because there might be many chi's in the image, right? And for every chi, this t will be different, and this t will also be different. So how can the bounding chain sort of simulate this coin? The answer is that. If you if you work it out, you'll see that for a fixed chi, uh, the probability p, the value of this coin, will be one minus size of s over k minus t. And so as you can see, this coin will be different for every chi in the image. So are we screwed? No, we are not, because what we do is we make the bounding chain predict whether uh, uh, this guy, whether this chi, will use the color c1 or not. That is, we create a coin which underestimates this probability. Okay, and that coin, because t can be at most, this t can be at most of size delta. That underestimated coin is one minus size of s over k minus delta. Now, this is a coin that the bounding chain can very well simulate, and this underestimates every t, the 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 t for every t. Okay, because we have maximized this t to delta. Why are we doing this? Because we create a monotone coupling between these two coins. So basically, what happens is that uh, the bounding chain picks a color C1, okay? Then the bounding chain flips this coin. If this is head, because of the monotone coupling, the bounding chain says, "I am not going to pick any more colors. I'll just give C1 to to whatever chi I am considering, maybe what all the chi's, okay? And I'll give and I'll tell them that my coin came out to be heads, and since my coin is monotonically coupled to all of your individual coins. All of your coins have to also come out to be head, so you have to use this C1, and it will look like the marginal updates of every chi is a proper Glauber dynamics. So that is that is sort of our uh, underestimation thing. But it might ha also happen that the bounding chain's coin came out to be tail. Then the bounding chain can't do anything. Okay, then the bounding chain cannot do anything. It has to sample C2 and pass it part pass C1 and C2 down to all the chi's. And then the guys do their business. They sort of flip their own coins and uh, blah 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 blah. Okay, so this step, this precise step, is what gives us a non-trivial probability of actually contracting from a list of size two to a list of size one. Okay, and as you can see, this uh, this thing here also uh, to for this to be a, a bona fide probability, k has to be greater than delta plus size of s. This is where everything comes from. Okay. So this underestimation is is is, is like a is like a, an, another layer of coupling. So not only are we using a grand coupling, we are also coupling the coins that are used. Okay. So again, what does the bounding chain do? Sample C1, flips its coin. If head done. If not head, then sample C2 and pass the list on. That's it. Okay. And this is sort of a yeah. I I, I said all this in words. I think uh, yeah. Anyway, I I I said I said all all of these things in words. So, uh, any questions from this part? Okay, if no questions, then uh, okay, then then let's move on to the next bit. So, ha ha. So, okay. So now, where are we? So, if I, I can guarantee that I can get you inside somehow, if I can get you into the coalescence phase, and if I run this algorithm, then you are done. Then with k greater than three delta, you are done. But how do you get there? That is where this compress update business comes in. So the compress update 
uh, does uh, sort of a weird thing. So what we have to ensure is at the very beginning that the list drop down to size two, right? How do we do that? Why don't the list drop down to size two in Huber's thing? Because Huber has to, has, has to assign delta plus one colors, which ensures that uh, the containment prop property holds, the invariant holds. We do this artificially. Now, imagine this, that you had, you had the vertex Z and all of your neighbors, all of your neighbors have a list of size delta plus one. Suppose you, you, you're updating B and all of your neighbors have a list of size delta plus one. But there is this amazing promise that I give you that if you take the intersection of, of, of all of these lists, then there are delta colors in common. So each list has a common prefix of delta colors and maybe one more color extra, okay? That's great news because then uh, the update at, uh, at this guy, so, so how many blocking colors are there in total? The total number of blocking colors then are the delta common prefix colors and the delta extra colors, which uh, might be uh, occupying the delta plus one s position of e each list. So again, how many total blocking colors add V delta of the prefix colors, which are common to everybody and one extra color for each vertex. So a total of two delta. Okay. So with K, <clears throat> so with K greater than two delta, this guy can update to a very, very small size. List. So that is sort of, uh, sort of what, what we are going to, as in, once you know this, you can run maybe a contract update and get a list of size two. Then that's precisely what we do. So if you're given this promise, that everybody has this huge intersection of, del of delta colors, then you know that your number of blocking colors is at most two delta. You have already anyways taken your, you have taken K, K greater than three delta. So the condition, the, the condition for running the co a contract update is satisfied and you can run contract and get a list of size two, at most two in fact, it can even drop down to one, great. So how do we do that? How do we, en uh, how do we sort of ensure this promise? by this very weird thing. So what we do is we will fix a, so in the paper, we do something a little more complicated, but let me just uh, say, say, say something here. So we'll fix a set of Delta colors called A. Okay. There's some subset. It's, this is arbitrary. There's no random picking or any such thing going on. This is, this is an arbitrary set of, uh, set of Delta colors. And the first N steps at every vertex, we will do the following. We'll go to that vertex. And we will pick one color C1 from K minus A uniformly at random. And the list at, at that vertex will be updated as A union C1. So this is my Delta plus one sized list that we will assign at every vertex for the first N steps. So first question, how do we ensure that each vertex is hit if we are not running for N log N type? So this is a very subtle point. So we are running what we call an SSGD and six systematic sweep block global dynamics. So for the first N Delta time or say N time, we will update according to an ordering on the vertices. It can be shown that this does not change the, the stationary distribution of the underlying CFTP chains, each of the CFTP chains. This is, this is a standard uh, exercise in Markov chain theory. And we do this to simplify the analysis, just to simplify the analysis, but it, it could very well have worked the same way with uh, the coupon collector type of thing also. Okay. So we do this SSGD systematic sweep and we ensure that at every vertex, you have a list of size A, a, a list of size Delta plus one, which is a union uh, random co color C1. Okay. And containment is fine. So, uh, yeah, containment is uh, containment is the question, right? Uh, containment once again. Okay, okay, okay. So okay, so the question is now okay. Delta plus one list of kardia at every vertex. Delta plus one size list kardia promise be aagya ki intersections have at most two delta colors. Great, great, good. How do you ensure that the marginal updates are still GD type of updates? That's the issue. So what we do again is buy something. Okay. So we do the following that, uh, let's say you have an underlying chi during the warm-up phase and this guy, uh, sees, uh, this guy knows the A, okay. this guy knows the A, but also remember that there is a blocking set T, the, the chi NV. Okay. 
So maybe now we are doing this update at the U. For a change, we are doing update at the U. And there is this blocking set and A, 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 A lies right here. So the algorithm works like this. So suppose that uh, you had, you, uh, you pick C1, right? So along with A, you had to pick a random C1. The, the, the bounding chain had to pick a random C1. Maybe that C1 fell into the blocking set. It's a bad case. It's a pretty bad case, right? So what we ask I to do is, since C1 fell in, it definitely, and, and, and since the size of A union C1 is delta plus one, and C1 is a color lying outside of A, there is most definitely a color that lies inside A, which does not lie inside the block set. So from among those colors, uh, from among those colors, pick a color uniformly at random, which is precisely what is written here. Pick C2 uniformly at random from A minus the block set. Okay. And set, and if you cannot use C1, then uh, set the color at U to be C2. This is case one. But case two, when you can use C1, what do you do? So C1 is not inside the blocking set. Great. Again, we have to do this by sampling business so that, so what is our requirement here? The requirement is again the same thing that the distribution outside the blocking set is uniform. So C1 is outside the blocking set. Great. So if you flip a coin with probability of head P, if head C U U, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, right. If heads, this is, I think this, this will be ulta. So if heads, you accept C1 and uh, no, 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 this guy, this guy, sorry, this guy. So if, if heads, uh, you, 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 you color with, just one second, I think there's a typo here. Yeah, there's absolutely a typo here. Sorry, this will be C1 and C2. So if heads, you use C1 because you know that C1 lies, uh, lies outside the blocking set. Great. Um, if tails, you go and check out C2. Same same sort of logic. You you go go and check out C2, which was sampled from uh, from out uh, from A minus uh, the blocking set. Now A minus the blocking set might be empty, so you might not have turned turned up a C2 at all. If that is the case, you go back to C1 and you reuse C1. Okay, and same sort of calculation. If you do the same sort of calculation, you will see that you can come up with a value of this p. This is another p. This is a different p for a diff for for the compress kind of updates so that the distribution outside the blocking set is uniform and that's it. So now what happens? So now uh, what is this? This, this was a com 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 complex kind of update. So what actually happens in the algorithm is this. So the focus remember is bringing the list sizes down to two. So at, at the very beginning at my time minus T, we will assign the set of all colors to every vertex, same as Hubert. This, this, this is a minus T. Subsequently, you go to every vertex one by one systematic sweep and you assign the set A union C1, where C1 is picked uniformly at random. Remember that uh, from, uh, from K minus A, right? So you assign those lists uh, to all these guys and um, hmm. yeah, and then you come back. Then you come back and start again. You, so, so now when you have come back to U1, everybody's list is size delta plus one. And not only that, the promise has been enforced that their intersections are of size delta because the A is a prefix and also the containment property is satisfied and that the individual uh, evolutions of the underlying CFTPs, which we cannot simulate, those evolutions are uh, honest to God, uh, uh, legitimate global dynamics evolutions. So everything is fine. So now when you come back, you can just do comp, uh, contract, contract, contract. So, so that, that is what is being shown here. So you do a contract when you come back to one and the list size at U1 drops to size two. Now you will go to two, but there is a sort of an issue. As you can see that uh, the intersection property that the intersection had uh, delta co a, a delta size prefix for everybody may, may no, no longer be true because this guy has a list of size two now and this has nothing to do with it. So that is where things get a, get slightly hairy, but uh, with a little bit of clever, cleverness and not much more than this, uh, maybe five lines, we can get around this. And 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 that's that's pre pretty much it. That, and and this this uh, getting around this problem is why we can't do it in something like order and we have to do order and data. And that's the algorithm. So 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 what happens? So in the warm up phase, you do this entire compress compress contract compress com compress contract. 
every list size drops down to size two, lists of everybody drops down to size two. Then once that has happened, you very happily move into coalescence. Coalescence pe you start picking vertices randomly and you do a contract update only. And uh, usual sorts of calculations with probability at least half in time order in delta times log n, you see W0 equal to that. Uh, and that's it. That's it. That's the algorithm. Questions? So running time of warm up of Huber was like n log n, is it? And here yes. it depends on the. Yeah, here, uh, here it's a deterministic ordering. So it depends on how many times we are going back and updating things. So it's n delta. Okay. And the coalescence phase is same. Coalescence phase is same because coalescence phase, we are picking vertices randomly, right? Coalescence phase, each vertex is, uh, is uh, picked randomly. So you need something like delta times n log n. So the n log n factor will have to come. The log n multiplicative has to come because of the, the this thing. The, uh, so the time is also your uh, smaller. Is that for? Sorry? Uh, so that, I mean, the, so it, uh, it sort of depends on delta that whether you have a yes. running time is smaller or not. Yeah. So, so, so delta can be, delta is the max degree, right? So delta can be at most n minus one. So it's still polynomial. I meant compared to Uber. Oh, right. Yes. 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 Compared to, yeah. yeah. So, so you, uh, I think Huber also has n delta log n, right? Let, let, let me just check. Huber, I think he has n delta also. Yeah. The second one. The set. Coalescent spaces and delta log n is what I, I think. Ah, so uh, just where did I get this? Ah, uh -huh, yes, yes. Yeah, so so n n delta log n has to be this. Delta multi multiplicative has to come. This is uh, okay. so it, this sort of you know this this falls out from this uh, uh, analysis of W T because W T is a, is an integer which does a random walk from a, zero to n, where zero is a reflecting state and n is an absorbing state. So once it's n, it remains n. And if you do that analysis, you will see that this sort of a running time will just fall out. Uh, but delta has to come. I mean, this is uh, this is un as of now at least it's unavoidable. I think there's a lower bound of n log n of some sort. But I'm not sure about that. One question. Uh, yeah, yeah. General, general high level question. So if you go back to the approximate versus perfect sampling uh, thing you had. Right. So that uh, the best known so far is k bigger than some 11 by 6, 6 delta, whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah, you have about 3 delta, right? Yes. That's what, uh, so, delta. so the current is 8 by 3. Where is uh, it? So, so the current best known for perfect sampling huh. uh, is 8 by 3 delta. So, oh, eight eight, eight. Yeah, so eight eight eight. somebody improved it as Jain Sahin Sahani. I was mentioning. Oh, I see. I thought that was three delta. Okay, okay. No, no, no. Uh huh. No, no, eight by three delta. Three, three delta is our paper. Three uh, delta sorry, is our so, paper. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So this is eight by three. Is it okay? Yes. Anyway, so question is are these expected to be same or what are they expected to be? Uh, that is a very, very good question. So we have been actually trying to, we had been trying at some point to show something like this, that if you can do perfect sampling, then you can do approximate sampling also. So perfect imp implies approximate, but certain the other way you mean, right? Uh, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Right. So approximate uh -huh. implies perfect. So we had been trying something like this, but uh, there are some complexity theoretic things that maybe indicate that that's not quite true. I see. But what are the expect? Is there any expected numbers here, or uh, it's uh... so expected? We we think that since it's so three was a big roadblock for us. Huh. Then uh, we we at least he Siddharth and I could not get it below three. Uh, after after that, these guys say Jain Sa and Sahani, uh, they used uh, this Mosher fix. Uh, fixed it algorithm and that 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 paper is stunning okay they really understood but we have talked we talked to them and it seems like uh, sort of this is at a at a bottleneck so they identified a bottleneck structure and they showed that it doesn't even with that you can get it down 
but that's it i mean these you are things, you are saying about the currently available methods of yeah current method. available method it, we uh, don't expect to get it down further but maybe i i, I think it can be done till two delta i expect so because not one plus epsilon delta or something one plus right. epsilon is open even for approximate right so you don't think that is true no no right? no if you ask eric bigoda eric bigoda apparently is a very uh, optimistic person and he is the person who did this if you you'll understand why he's optimistic if you read this paper he has an infinite lp uh -huh. for some reason he chops that lp into a finite lp and he proves that that is still fine and for some reason he can predict these huge values in his head and he is able to write down the solution to that lp and that works and i have absolutely no idea how he could have seen that but he did it so maybe it is possible to get it down somewhat but people have been trying for some time and uh, I'm, not, I'm not so optimistic no, i understand it's a hard problem but but, yeah. but then people may have expectations so i was wondering what is the expectation so the, the expectation so the best would be delta plus one right so, yeah. or some del right. so that so, is like i mean even I, what i asked was weaker one plus epsilon delta actually one plus epsilon plus delta for approximate sampling there are results for very specific classes of graphs Uh -huh. So for random graphs, and in fact, I think for planar graphs, the result is square root delta. I see. So, so this this very stunning result by uh, Hayes, Hayes, Tom Hayes. So he has got it down to square root delta, but that 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 that's an old old result. And uh, yeah, other than that, so in, in pockets, like improvements have happened in sort of specific classes of graphs, so the high degree. So with high degree things become slightly easier because you can use turn off sort of bounds. Uh -huh. You can say things like for all vertices things will happen, but uh, yeah, for general delta for uh, bounded delta below log n it's hard. It's very hard. Yeah, very nice. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so shall, uh, uh, if there are no more questions i'll just stop sharing my screen then oh, oh. okay i don't know if there any maybe we can uh, give a round of uh, 